Well, it's so wonderful to be with you this morning, so great that we can come together on this one of the Sundays of Easter. You remember that you know, Easter Sunday is not just one day a year. Uh, the truth of Easter, the joy of Easter, the great purpose of Easter is not just for one hour on one day a year. In fact, even on the liturgical calendar, Easter lasts you know, for seven Sundays, not just one Sunday. It's, it's important for us to remember all of the, the, the meaning for our lives that comes with the resurrection of Jesus Christ. And so uh, last week we began a series together looking at our next life together. Uh, our next life but starting right now. Sometimes people think that Easter is such great good news because it reminds us that when we die we get to go to heaven. Well that is really good news. I don't, how, how many of you are pretty happy about that? Uh, I would expect that to be pretty much 100%. I hope it is. If it's not, then, um, yeah. well, anyway, uh, I'm, I'm really glad that, uh, that, 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 you know, I get to go to heaven uh, when, when I die. But, but the miracle of Easter and the good news of the resurrection of Jesus Christ is not just for the next world. It's not just for the time that we die and go to stand before the Lord, which we believe we will one day. It's for now. Uh, the, the, the truth of Easter has tremendous ramifications and meaning for our lives today, here and now, because as we read last week in the book of Ephesians, how many of you are reading Ephesians for your personal devotions this month? Uh, thanks very much. I appreciate the support on that. Uh, I at least appreciate your honesty, which is great. Well, anyway, if you're looking for something to read over the next month, Ephesians is your book, okay? Think about that. It's got, you know, it's got uh, six chapters, and there's six, anyway, you're, you're one chapter behind, but, but uh, don't give up, okay? Last week, we looked at Ephesians and the truth of Ephesians in chapter 1 that tells us that the same power that raised Christ from the dead is alive in you. Wow. Now think about that. We could describe that power, I guess, in a lot of different ways with a lot of different adjectives and terms, but that same power that raised Jesus Christ from the dead is alive in you. Someone needs to hear that. Turn to your neighbor and tell them that. The same power that raised Christ from the dead is alive in you. Tell your other neighbor. The same power that raised Christ from the dead is alive in you. Never forget that. That's what the Scripture tells us, and we need to remember that. It's so important for us to remember that. You don't want to live below your potential. You know, we kind of laughed about that last week, but it's true. It's a sad thing when people live below their potential. I, you know, I, I told you that you know, as a freshman in college, I had people talking in both, you know, both of my ears. One was saying, hey, Crawford, you, you score fairly high on some of these tests we've given you. Uh, on the other hand, your grades look like you're dumb as a rock. And so where, you know, where, how, there's a disconnect there. You're living way under your potential, young man. And I was glad that I had some caring people in my life that were willing to point that out to me. I kind of already knew it, but sometimes it helps to have someone point it out even if you already know it, right? It's not a good thing to live below your potential or beneath your potential. Every coach has... Some athletes like that, they're trying to continually to encourage those athletes to live into who they can really be athletically. Every educator has some students like that. That's the kind of student I was for a while, right? Uh, the, live up to your potential. And as Christians, it's so important for us to remember to live into the tremendous potential that God has given to us. That same power that raised Christ from the dead is alive and at work in you. Uh, we went to see uh, Moses at the Sight and Sound Theater last night. Anybody ever been to the Sight and Sound Theater in Branson? Uh, I know 53 of us have been because 53 of us went yesterday. But if you haven't been there, you owe it to yourself. You know, I'm not a promoter or anything, except I am going to promote uh, the, the great biblical shows that they have there. They're tremendous. I've seen shows in, on Broadway and in Soho and London and so forth. I'm telling you, nothing's better than that. They have a tremendous theater, they have a great show, and it will, you'll, you'll hear the biblical story interpreted and, 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 and shared with you in a, in a new and kind of a fresh way. It's really a lot of fun as well. So check it out. Moses will be playing through uh, December 31st. By the way, one of the graduates of our United Methodist University, Oklahoma City University, is playing the role of Pharaoh, and he does a great job. So anyway, you need to go check it out and, uh, and, and, and see. Right now it's the story of Moses. Many of you remember the story of Moses. Remember God's people were in bondage, in slavery in Egypt. And God comes to this guy named Moses in a burning bush. Remember the whole story? And, and the, the, you know, Moses looked a little bit like Charlton Heston. And uh, he, he, come, he comes to Moses and he says, Moses, 
I'm going to free the people, free my people from slavery. And Moses says, that's awesome, God. Go get them. And then God says, and by the way, you're it. <laughs> and Moses starts really doing the backtrack, right? He starts crawdadding really fast. And he says, wait, hold on a minute. He said, Lord, I, 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 can't, I, I, I can't even speak well. And finally, you know, he has this arguing with God, and God says, no, no, I'm telling you, you're the guy. And finally, at the end, Moses runs out of excuses, and he just, he, he says what you and I have heard a million times when we've been trying to recruit people. <laughs> he says, okay, I'm with you, but just find somebody else, right? And God gets a little upset and says, where's your brother? <laughs> Go get your brother Aaron. And he finds Aaron and brings Aaron up, and he says, okay, you're going to be like God to Aaron, and Aaron's going to be like your prophet. And you're going to tell Aaron what to say, and then we'll let Aaron do the talking. It's interesting in the story, if you keep reading, once they get to Egypt, Aaron doesn't really say very much. Moses begins to speak on his own often because really the whole point and purpose of having Aaron there with him was to give Moses a sense of confidence. That's it. Moses lacked confidence. I suppose in some level he maybe lacked confidence in God, but mostly he lacked confidence in himself. He said, God, I know you can do this, but you don't want someone like me. Moses needed some confidence, and Aaron was there to build Moses' confidence. That's one of the most important things that we can offer one another in the body of Christ. I really believe that. One of the most important things, gifts maybe you can offer the person that's sitting next to you right now today is that gift of encouragement for confidence. You and I can be confident in Christ because we belong to God. We belong to Jesus Christ. We have that same power that raised Jesus Christ from the dead working in us. And so if anyone ever had reason to be confident, it's the people of God. It's God's church. Your next life, not when you die, but the life that you can live into right now is a life of confidence. Say that to somebody. Your next life is a life of confidence. Go ahead. Your next life is a life of confidence. Your next life is a life of confidence confidence. That's so very important. Now remember, confidence is not, you know, grandiose thinking. To be a confident person doesn't mean that I believe everything in the future is going to go my way. When I say I'm a person, that I'm a confident person, it doesn't mean that I know that God's going to do everything I want God to do. When I say I'm confident, it doesn't mean that I know that God is going to answer my prayers just like I want God to answer my prayers. It doesn't mean that there's no longer going to be any struggle. It doesn't mean that there aren't going to be some failures out there in the future. It, what it means is that I believe that because God is with me and because that power of Christ is living within me, whatever happens, we're going to make it through. And, it, and we're going to keep going. And it's going to be okay because God is with me. That's a sense of Christian or biblical confidence. It's not grandiose thinking that everything is going to go perfectly. It's believing and trusting that God goes with us. You know that we've been looking at trying to get some funding from the conference for starting a, a, a new a satellite church on the south side of town. I was down yesterday, or Friday visiting with a New Faith Communities group, and I think the conversation went pretty well. But I've had a couple people phrase the question like this, Ray, are you, are you pretty sure this is going to happen? And, and all I can say is I'm pretty sure we're going to try. <laughs> That's really all I can say. I mean, I don't know. Who knows how God will answer this prayer? And who knows when you've got a lot of other people involved in making decisions. You can't control everyone, but I can tell you I can control myself. And we're going to try. We're going to try. And I have confidence that no matter how things go, God's going to equip our church to be whatever God wants our church to be. I am absolutely confident of that. That God will not call us to something that God won't also equip us for and help us do. And I don't know exactly how that's going to happen. Uh, I, I, you know, I'm positive about it, but we'll see. But I do have confidence. That's one of the things that, if you're a parent or a grandparent here this morning, you know that that's one of the most important gifts you can give your child, is some confidence. Thank you for being a good parent. You know, I had to have some confidence first time I stepped up to the plate playing baseball as a little kid. I had to have a, you know, a coach there and said, yeah, that, that, that kid's going to throw a ball as hard as he can right towards you, but you can hit it, all right? You know, it seemed a little crazy at the time, but I had to have someone help me have some... Imagine being a, a major leaguer when you stand up to the plate and someone's throwing a ball at you 100 miles an hour. That hurts. 
If it hits you, you've got to have some confidence to stand at the plate and even think you might be able to hit that pitch. Confidence is important. Thank you for being a good parent. I, I don't know about you, my generation, I, I've, I've found some commonality as I've, I've, as I've spoken to people my age. You know, my parents were really good parents, but they were kind of laissez-faire about things, you know? They kind of let me do some things, you know, in the summertime I can remember I'd leave the house in the morning and, you know, mom might say, we'll be back at dark. And, you know, that was the direction I had for the day. Anybody else know what I'm talking about? Anybody else raised that way? You know, and today it seems as parents are much more uh, involved in their children's lives. And there's definitely a good part of that. Thank you for being a great parent. I know lots of great parents in this church that are really active in their children's lives. That's fantastic. But, of course, even that can go too far. Uh, I've heard this term helicopter parents, and we've got to avoid that. You know, parents who are continually hovering around their child and they're involved in every single decision that their child makes. And they never want their child to fail, right? And, and, and they just hover over everything. And, 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 and instead, ironically, that really kind of ruins the confidence of your child because then they feel like they can't make a good decision on their own. Then they feel like if mom or dad or some you know, adult's not around, I can't, I'm just helpless, so that's not good. We've got to find a balance you know, in there somewhere. Sometimes letting your kid or your grandkid fail can be a good thing because then they learn some of one of, my life's, one of life's most important lessons, and that is that failure is not permanent unless you let it be, right? And that's a really, really important lesson to learn in life. And so you know, we've we got to find ways to help our children and our grandchildren live with a sense of confidence. It's a great gift we can give them. As Christians, our confidence is in Christ. Say that with me. Our confidence is in Christ. Let's read together from Ephesians chapter 1, uh, verses 11 through 14. In Christ, we have also obtained an inheritance, having been destined according to the purpose of Him who accomplishes all things according to the counsel, His counsel and will, so that we who were the first to set our hope on Christ might live for the praise of His glory. In Him you also, when you had heard the word of truth, the gospel of your salvation, and had believed in Him, were marked with the seal of the promised Holy Spirit. This is the pledge of our inheritance toward redemption as God's own people to the praise of His glory. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Amen. Life goes better. Life goes better with a little confidence. We try to teach that to our children. Coaches teach that to their players. Educators teach that to their students. We try to help one another in the family unit or in business. You know, how many times in work have we had a challenge come up in our place of, of, of business, and one of the most important things in that challenge is to make sure everybody still has a sense of confidence that we can get through whatever this challenge might be. Life goes better with some confidence. So have a, hey, as I mentioned in the family, you know, it's, it's important to have confidence in the family unit. It's important to have confidence in your marriage, I think we have a picture of a, of a couple celebrating their 50th anniversary. I hope to get there someday myself. Uh, it, it's important to have a little confidence in, in your marriage. If someone asks me if I'm married, I'll say, well, yes, as a matter of fact, I am. And then if they ask me a silly question like, well, how do you know you're married? How can you be so confident that you're married? I, I might point out a few things. Uh, and, and one of the things I would point out is, well, you probably noticed that I have a ring on my finger. This is a symbol, this is a sign, a seal of a covenant that I made with Kathy uh, many years ago, over 30 years ago. And, and it's, a, it's a sign, it's, it's a symbol of this covenant that we've made together. I never take it off, and any time I look at it or feel it on my hand, it reminds me of this great covenant that we have together. Oh, okay, what else? Well, somewhere at home I've got a document. It, it, it's, it's, a, it's a marriage license. And to uh, tell you the truth, I couldn't tell you exactly where that is right now, but I could find it eventually. And, 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 when, I, and when I found it, it would, it would have our names on it. It would be signed by official people and stamped with a seal and all that good stuff. It's an official document, and it says we are married. So if I forget or am wondering if I'm still married, all i got to do is pull that thing out. I can look at it. Oh, yep, I am. I'm married. And I also have a living relationship with my wife. 
If you ask me if I'm married, how do you know you're married? Well, as a matter of fact, my wife and I have already had a conversation this morning. As a matter of fact, we've already had prayer together. In fact, we were praying for you. Uh, we've already had prayer together. We've already had a conversation together. I'm planning to have some lunch with her after. You know, I have this ongoing relationship with her. And it's a great reminder to me that I'm married, this important covenant that I have. Our confidence, you see, friends, is in Christ. And sometimes people ask, how can you know? How can you be so confident in your walk and in your relationship with Jesus Christ? And I think there's some real parallels here. Well, first of all, we have the sign of a covenant. With Christ, it's not a wedding ring. It's something we call baptism. The sign of the covenant. And though we can't see that watermark on our head any longer, God can. I've sometimes teased the confirmands and said, I'm going to put indelible ink in the water of baptism this year. So when that runs down your face, it's going to be there forever. (laughs) And anytime you look at yourself, you're going to remember, I'm a baptized Christian. That really is that important. We have the sign of the covenant. It's in our baptism. And it's important for us to sometimes remember our baptism. And when you remember your baptism, you're really remembering your identity. You're remembering who you are. Mark 16, 16 says it very simply. It says, those who believe and are baptized will be saved. Several years ago, I had a dad come up, at, you know, a dad of one of the confirmands, and say, Pastor, I, I kind of like to be baptized too with my child. I said, fantastic, let's do that. I'd love to do it. I said, but I noticed you've been a part of the church for a long time. You know, how, you never been baptized? I said, no, I just never thought it was that important until you told me, you know, that those who believe and are baptized will be saved, and that seems pretty straightforward to me. And so no one ever explained it like that before. And uh, so I think I ought to be baptized. And so let's do it, brother. And we, and, and we did that. Uh, if you've never been baptized, that's an important part. It's, that's not what saves you, but it's an important sign and seal of this covenant that you have with Christ. Galatians 3.27 says, As many of you as were baptized into Christ have clothed yourself with Christ. When we're baptized into Christ, we put on the Lord Jesus Christ. You know, one of the things we're trying to do in this series is think through some of the misunderstandings we sometimes have of the Christian faith. To be a Christian does not mean that you just put, you know, that you put God first in your life. Hmm. Now I'll say it again. Being a Christian does not mean that you put God first in your life. Being a Christian doesn't even mean that you put Jesus first in your life. Now, it includes that, (laughs) and you should do that, but it's so much more than that. Being a Christian is not just making Christ some priority in your life along with everything else. That's not what it means. Being a Christian means that you clothe yourself with the, the, the Lord Jesus Christ. That you allow Christ to live within you, to permeate every fiber of your being and live into this new creation that God would design you to be. It includes keeping your priorities straight, but it's so much more than that. Being a Christian isn't just putting Christ first in your life. It's clothing yourself in the Lord Jesus Christ. Secondly, if you ask me if I'm a Christian, I'll say, sure, I've got the signature of God's Word. You know, and and this is what I'm talking about. I'm not talking about a license necessarily. I'm talking about God's Word. 1 John 3, 1 says, See what love the Father has given us, that we should be called the children of God, and that is who we are. Will you turn to your neighbor and tell them you're a child of God? You're a child of God. Tell them you belong to Christ. You belong to Christ. That's who you are. And we must never forget that. And on those days when you're just not feeling it, how many of you ever have days like that? You know, you're, today, you know, Sunday mornings, it's a little easier to feel it, maybe. Uh, maybe. <laughs> but on some days, it's, you know, you may just not, hey, who cares? Your relationship with Christ is not based on how you might feel on any particular day. Your relationship with Christ is not based on how you feel at any particular hour of the day. I know people who who really worry and struggle with their faith in Christ because they depend upon how they're feeling, and that's just like a roller coaster, up and down all the time. Our, Our relationship with Christ is not finally based on some feeling that we may have. I like feelings. Those are good. It's based on the Word of God, and God has claimed you, and it's in the Word, and we need to remember that. Uh, and then third, we have the seal of the Holy Spirit. And now we're talking about a relationship. If you ask me if I'm a Christian, I'll say yes. 
As a matter of fact, Jesus and I had a conversation about 20 minutes ago. If you ask me if I'm a Christian, I'll say, yes, Christ is present with me right now. I know you can't see him, but I know he's here. If you ask me if I'm a Christian, I'll say yes, because I have an ongoing life-giving relationship with my Savior. Ephesians 1, 13 through 14 says it like this, in him... You were marked with the seal of the promised Holy Spirit. This is the pledge of our inheritance toward redemption as God's own people to the praise of His glory. You belong to Christ. So friend, whatever challenge you're facing this morning, whatever challenges there may be in your life, whatever hurdles that you may be facing today, remember that you face those challenges as a child of God. You face those challenges with a Savior who will walk with you and beside you and within you every step of that journey because that is who you are. Never forget that. You belong to Christ. So, walk on. Knowing that the presence of God goes before you, the Spirit of God lives within you, and the power of God has your back. Amen? If you're able, will you stand and let's pray together. Thank you, God, for your love and for your grace. Uh, We thank you, Lord, for your precious Holy Spirit living in us and through us and moving around us. We thank you, O Lord, for your presence with us this morning. God, as we go through the challenges of life, and they are many, help us to do so, God, with a sense of confidence. Confidence not only in our own abilities, but confidence, O God, in you that we belong to you, that you love us and care for us and are going to walk with us every step of the journey. We thank you, O Lord, and we pray in the name of our loving and living Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen.